Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans, and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So, while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright.
So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Wow, 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 wow. If we're only brave enough to be it. Welcome everybody. I want to thank you for being here this afternoon or this evening. My name is Miguel Bustos and I'm Glide's director for the Center for Social Justice. And so we're very glad you're joining us. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Hannah if she could spotlight our incredible speakers and poets that are with us today. Um, so for those of you that don't know, that was Amanda Gordon. Um, not only was she the poet who spoke at the inauguration this past, this past January, but you may not know that actually Glide saw her talent last year. And we, through the, the Legacy Gala Committee or the Legacy Committee, uh, Glide honored her with the Janice Mirakitani Award. So how fitting that today, as we celebrate poetry and its spoken word and its, its just message of justice, that we have Janice with us today. We also have um, three other incredible, incredible poets. We have uh, Tony Robles, who is a native San Franciscan, um, and I'll talk more about Tony. We have Tongo Eason, who is actually San Francisco's eight poet laureate, and we have Glide's own Tori Pinto. So with your hands, let's give them a round of applause and thank them for, for joining us today. Hey, Tony. So um, let's see, Hannah, can they see the speakers? I can only spotlight one of you at a time right now. Oh, I'm sorry you're having to see me. Okay, all right. So what we'll do is we're gonna go and have each speaker, uh, each poet, uh, do a, a two poems each. But before we go, let me give you a little bit more about these incredible individuals. So the first poet we're gonna hear is Janet Mirakitani, who's a co-founder of Glide. Janet has really had an incredible life, um, but in the beginning, it wasn't always good. She was incarcerated and interned during the World War II's in, uh, concentration camps in Arkansas along with about 120 other Japanese uh, Americans and people of Japanese ancestry. But instead of taking that and using it as something as a crutch, she used it as something that empowered her. So her and Reverend Cecil Williams, the co-founder started Glide, our San Francisco's iconic Glide uh, Memorial Church. She was actually the, the second poet laureate of San Francisco and the author of five books on poetry. Thank you, Janice, for being here. Thank you, Megan. Tongo uh, Eisen, well, he's originally from San Francisco as well, and he is currently San Francisco's <laughs> poet laureate. He is a poet movement worker and educator. Uh, he's written several books and several poems um, that you could actually buy at any point. So we encourage you to go to your local bookstore. Um, one book is Someone's Dead Already, was nominated for a California Book Award. His latest book, Heaven is All Goodbyes, was published by City Lights Pocket Poet Series. And he has a forthcoming book called Blood on the Fog, which will be released this fall. Thank you, Tango, for being here. Then there's Tony Robles, who is called the People's Poet, was born in San Francisco. He is the author of Cool Don't Live Here Anymore, 
a letter to San Francisco, and fingerprints of a hunger strike. He's currently in residence um, in uh, North Carolina and resides in Henderson. Then we have Tori, thank you for being here, Tony. Then we have Tori Pinto, as I mentioned, she is currently Glide's uh, Community Engagement Volunteer Program Manager and writes poetry on her free time. Uh, she first got a, uh, encouraged to write poetry from her high school teacher, Ms. Dotsie, um, and enjoys a wide range of poetry. And we're so honored to have her here. So thank you all. Um, so we're gonna start the evening from hearing from San Francisco's second poet laureate, uh, Janice Mirakatani, who will share two of her incredible poems with us. Janice. Thank you for having me, Miguel, and for all those in the Center for Social Justice at Glide, and for all the work that our staff is doing. I mean, I take great pride in everything that we continue to do, even during the pandemic, and even increasing the services that we provide for people who are most in need. My poetry try, uh, attempts to connect um, our common uh, oppression, our, co our common struggles, our common, uh, everything that is common about us as human beings, uh, because I do think that we're tied by so many more things than what we realize. So, um, I, you know, I started writing poetry when I was in grammar school uh, as a means of survival, because I was forced into silence about a lot of difficulties I was facing as a, in my childhood. So, um, and of course, it, you know, I hope I grew, but uh, this poem is, um, was written uh, remembering our connection with the Jewish community. When I was growing up in a small rural, almost all white community, my friend in junior high school was Irene Rosenbaum. I think our families were bonded by a few things. One was our mothers. Mine and hers seemed to have a talent for guilt and for not wasting food. The feast of comfort and food the Rosenbaums offered us, I think, came from a common knowledge of pain and rejection. Though there was not open discussion of it, both families were aware of each other's history. Ours of Japanese American internment in concentration camps and their struggles against anti-Semitism. I call this poem Mrs. Rosenbaum's Latkes. Irene's mother, Mrs. Rosenbaum, would stuff me with potato latkes. Said I was too skinny. Eat, eat. Don't waste anything, she said. Look at what my latkes do, does for Irene. And for sure, the latkes did not do for me what it did for the envious shape of Irene. Mrs. Rosenbaum gave us bags of apples, red, juicy, ripe apples that the birds would eat, she said, if we wouldn't take them. She knew the apples in our orchard were like, in our orchard, bared little crippled hands. That orchard withered during the war when we went into American concentration camps. The government confiscated our land and laid waste. All was vandalized and ravaged. She said she remembered the wild geese who feasted on our fallen apples, loud flocks of them waddling among trees. And it reminded her of the stories of those geese. She said, those loud geese, they set out to flurry among the children being led to ovens. What did she say? I didn't hear what she said open mouths of little children and the squalling of geese, the beating of wings. Here, Mrs. Rosenbaum stuffed the bags bursting with apples into our arms. Don't waste anything. Wow. The second poem um, I wrote, of course, during this madness of the uh, anti-hate crimes against the Asian American Pacific Islander community, uh, which is much broader than the acronyms AAPI captures, 
we have we have so many different ethnic cultures and backgrounds and nationalities in the Asian cultures and uh, uh, you know among so among so many of our new immigrants as well as our ancestors who who immigrated to this country. Uh, and I think, I mean, I still hold a set, the centuries of persecution against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and all of our different cultures in so many ways. But um, this tries to uh, capture some of the stereotypes that have caused our dehumanization. And it's entitled, What Form of Madness? You build walls to divide us. It's madness. We who served your table, cooked your food, harvested your sugar cane. We have worked your canneries, picked your crops, built your railroads. You claim war against trade agreements, blame us for deadly COVID imported from China. Call it the China virus, the Kong flu. Incite more race hatred. It's madness. You beat us with baseball bats, jail us in concentration camps. You kidnap our women and sell them as sex slaves, garment workers. You tell us to go back where we belong, call us enemy aliens. You rip our children from us and cage them like animals. You lynch us, run, it out of, run us out of our homes. You call us jack, chink, slope, tonto, flip, stick, spook, raghead to cage our humanity. The hate crimes rise, killings keep mounting, madness. But we stand against your sickness. We stop the spread of your bigotry. Look about you and see all our mouths. We will not be driven out because of your hate. We will tear down the walls of fear and build bridges of love. We know all acts of compassion are victories in our war for justice. We defy your lies, ignite the light of truth from our throats. We stand up against violence. We are not alone. We won't dwell in your cages. It's our form of madness. Wow. Thank you. Everybody give her applause. Here we go. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Janice, so much. Thank you. Um, and just to let everybody know, after we're done with the, our round of poetry, we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, Tongo Eisen Martin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, what an honor it is to have you here and to share your wisdom uh, with us. So, Tongo, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, from a two floor skyline, an abandoned house once talked to me. It said, young man, you are heroic and 10 years old. Among 20 generations of friends, your friends will free fall away. They will free fall up. They will free fall to walls with, with fifth grade speed to industrial paint behind secondhand fences. Young man, use quick knife tones. Be bone and brass. Be last laugh music. You are always leaving. Always want to change your clothes from the door of life and escape. A two floor skyline said, you're the guy that dies in the middle. The friend more blues than skin. The face that cheap hotel schizophrenics can place with their 90 mile per hour ride eyes among dry heat killers once children. Three feet high and roaming and repeating and aiming at cotton mirrors that hang on breathing walls you're 10 years old tagging along, yawning at well-lit violence, whistling tool shop songs, you will be useful. You will be high and alone. Flying on a nephew dragon from a $20 family in a sky that calls itself just more soil. Around walls that are just walls, except these walls suggest you make wives out of highs and currency. Here the air is polite to sleepy glass and bullying your walls. Young man, you will come to admit that sometimes suicide is power because some people live stronger as goats. And sometimes the afterlife empties billions of souls into objects like playground bullets and abandoned door frames, even broken glass or poop that has waste too. They're 24 hours behind your back. Look over your shoulder right now. Can you hear it? 
the sound of drums punching themselves out, the sound of piano parts learned in between assassination attempts, be boning and brass, be boning up for two souls, be invincible again. Suffer red eyed accents, professional fingertips, gifted victims, six in the morning, beard, the first month of probation, a shot at the wall, see these words that shouldn't be home, look behind you again. Be invincible again, be winning, be a sad machete, be her son, be a thief, still his back, left too long and never look away. The afterlife will empty and walk you home. You know, a lot of God can happen in three seconds. Not much heaven though. Here's a man before a fight, a leave me alone type character. Emerging from the penniless death of a one-way street fixing is yeah, just a fancy way of saying I'm gonna make it even if I have to drive backwards. All I have is court changes and a thousand backhands. Driving the street like I'm choking it. Car full of nephews, there hasn't been a son since November and there hasn't been a street I can't choke to death. This city better back down. Uh, you see this gun on the table? And something about staring until it all feels stable. Why wouldn't I protect everyone on my desk sleep late? My son better be quick. My daughter better shoot first because we fall for no one. You know, we fall for nothing. Okay, the first thing you'll feel is the heat. Uh, this woman would tell me, you know, telling me about possession, drink, life, need is what I mostly hear. And most of the world leaves me alone to be smog like a giant, to go to jail every once in a while when the genocide kicks up in late May, when politicians have too easy a time. I'm guessing backwards out of one way street in honor of myself and in honor of you if you understand the nature of the world. How long I've been just like my father, you know, a real, a real resemblance says the anxiety of the neighborhood. This is a crossroads or, or a crossroads narrative with so much crossroads, people get in the habit of turning back. Let's turn back only to find themselves remembering me, but not my last words, a man before fights, you'll feel the heat, but there's nothing to keep in mind. There's nothing to remember. Really, there's nothing to be. There's just this moment, then another, then stare, then it all becomes stable, then the table lets go fuzzy and Friday is an unfamiliar face peeking in the window. It's cool to panic for a second. Composure is wasted on your worst enemies. People are marked on that sidewalk. You you are the only thing life size. Everybody knows this in a wire hanger empire when the blood stops walking, that feeling isn't father enough to be permission to fold. Better swing one more time. You know that father of yours rose from the grave and said, just give me five more minutes. That running water is a myth. It's us who are running up, down, and alongside this water. And people don't rise from the grave, they're not laid down neither. It's us who flip all around their body. So beware when the people around you all look like they about to jump. It might be your time. You'll feel the heat. And when four walls demand to be four walls and the earth outside mutes, don't panic. Don't try to recreate the earth outside. Don't tell jokes to yourself. Don't even talk disrespectfully to the four walls. Instead, unclench your fist and walk away. It might be heaven if you understand the nature of the world. Thank y'all. Wow. Woo! Woo! Wow, 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 wow. Can you do another one for us? All right, all right, thank you. Whew. My my fault. No, what I I what I was really saying that that was too. Oh, that was cool. <laughs> back, back, back. oh my god i just went into the next one well let me just tell right, you Tom, right. i wanted some more <laughs> but thank you, thank you thank you thank that. you thank you thank you so much right on right now on. Much love. thank you so much now tony tony robles all the way from north carolina thank you so much for being with us i think you're on mute you may be on mute, brother. Hey, I need to unmute. Hey, beautiful poetry. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, Janice, wonderful to see you. You know, my uncle used to say, he used to talk about you. He used to go and uh, go to the donut shop on 9th and Irving, and he used to have these chocolate donuts with a coconut on top. And he'd say, yeah, man, you know, Janice and I used to do these, uh, these readings. You got to see Janice when she's come out, and, you know, so he would tell me, um, these uh, things. And the thing that, you know, he always said was that our, our poetry was the best part of our struggle and our struggle was the best part of our poetry. And he, he loved to uh, kind of remember the old songs. And uh, one of the songs that he remembered was an old song called I Remember You, which really said a lot because, you know, there were so many people that were, were forgotten, you know, and uh, he made it his life's work to to not to not forget and to share so we'll never uh, forget we'll never get out we'll never forget them oh yeah Thanks, 
yeah. for sure. Um, I'm in the western uh, part of North Carolina. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half. So uh, it's considered a purple state. There's, uh, you know, it's part green and it's part red and part blue. So uh, you might see a rainbow flag passing by and then you might see a Confederate flag pass by 10 minutes later. So it's a, it's a different trip down here. But anyway, I, I, work in a, uh, I work in a thrift store and I'm gonna read two thrift store uh, poems for you tonight. So uh, this one is called uh, Be Water. This black brother came into the thrift store on a sunny day. Heavy rain poured last night, but somehow the sun burst from its hiding place in search of flowers. In this corner of North Carolina, the thrift store thrives under hellos, howdies, thank yous, God bless yous, and canned music from hidden speakers. And this black brother walked in looking for something, or perhaps something was looking for him. He walks up to the register and asks if we have any books on or by Bruce Lee. No, I say, we haven't had anything by Bruce in a while except for a VHS copy of Enter the Dragon for 50 cents. I like Bruce's philosophy, he said, when he said, be like water, my friend. Now, Bruce said that water can crash or it can flow, that it can assume different shapes. Fill a cup with water, it becomes the cup. Fill a pot, with water, it becomes the pot. The human body is made of water. Can I assume the shape of a six foot three, 200 or so pound black brother standing before me at the thrift store register? Can he assume the shape of a five foot nine inch Filipino thrift store cashier? Or better yet, can we assume the shape and depth of each other's minds? I told him that another thrift store might have a book by Bruce Lee. Thank you, he said. I love you, man. He said it in a sincere way that did not in any way seem odd. He meant it. Be water, my friend. Wow. Oh. And uh, I got to say, we find a lot of a lot of stuff in in the thrift store. I work in the cashier and the donation. In fact, um, I found a derby jacket. I don't know how it came, but it was a derby jacket that traveled three thousand miles from San Francisco and ended up in the uh, thrift store that I happened to be working at. So uh, this is this is one more um, uh, thrift store poem and as I said my uncle really uncle Al Robles poet Manila town poet I hotel poet uh, loved the old songs and there was an old song called it had to be you and uh, that's the name of the next poem it had to be you we've been wearing masks for over a year now trying to dodge the virus but we can't mask our feelings we can't hide our skin with a mask. And with my eyes exposed, I met the eyes of an older black woman from Georgia. In the thrift store that employs me, she asked if we offered a senior discount. And I remembered in the Philippines that seniors get a discount on everything. I'm afraid we don't have a senior discount, I said and the black woman's eyes met mine. I too am black and Filipino. And she said she was from Georgia. And I mentioned the Asian women that were killed in her home state and the anti-Asian violence across the country. Our community is getting hit hard, I said. And pointing to the skin on her arm, she said, 
Yes, I know about getting hit hard. It's terrible, she said, speaking behind her mask, eyes fully exposed. I'm not religious, but I asked her if she was a Christian. Yes, she answered. I asked her if she would pray for my community. And she said, yes, she would. Her eyes looking into mine. While the violence rages, the wars, the hatred, she said she would pray for my community, which is her community. I'm not religious, but she said she would pray for us. And I'm not so cynical as to discount her word. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Tony. Brother, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, it's great to have you. Um, Tori, our very own Tori Pinto, please give us some wisdom. Hello, everyone. Um, this is the first time that I have shared my poetry this widely. So um, please excuse the shakiness in my voice and the nerves that I fear are about to come out. Um, this, poem, <laughs> this poem is about speaking truth to power in terms of and in, in the context of an abusive relationship and about finding your own power. It's called The Gift. Feeling invisible and being invisible are almost the same thing. A feeling is just a feeling until it isn't. The evidence mounds, the bike on the floor, the unreturned favors, the inconsideration you take and take and never give back generous, he said. It's a certain kind of nice, she replied. It's when you give to others, but you don't know how to give to others, only yourself, like you're the biggest gift of all. You give when you have to, you always repay your debts, but you don't give freely unless it's mutually beneficial, but that's not a gift. It's just tit for tat. A gift is willingly given, selflessly given with the understanding you may never get anything back. Seems like we all spend our lives giving ourselves to those who choose to rise from the ashes of the fires. They burned of our hopes, our dreams, our lives, the lives they promised reduced to the lies they always were. Why is this the pattern? Why is this the place I return to broken, wanting more than you ultimately bargained for with us? I'm left in the dust of your collective exodus from this house, from my life. Where could I turn to find the light? Guess it has to be inside, or else I'll never find the courage to speak, to leave, to do anything I have to try, to be myself, to thrive, in spite of the prize I'll never win. But that's the gift I give to myself, my freedom, my liberation. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, this next poem is a poem that I wrote um, last year around the time of the, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and it's both a tribute and my own feelings mixed all in. It's called Black Life. People talk about death like death is the symptom, the symptom of a system rigged against its own people. Death isn't the symptom, but rather the end game, the final unrest for those who walk through life with a target on their back at all times, except what really makes them a target is their face. No matter how bundled up someone is, you can always judge their race. People say things have changed, started from the bottom, but they still there, American dream, nothing but a life full of fear, constantly looking over their shoulder, but that makes them suspicious. Police officers say that's just the business of doing their job of upholding the law, whatever happened to liberty and justice for all. We talk about death because it's the most tangible example of what happens when we forget that we're all just people, people trying to live, people trying to be, people who are simply just trying to breathe, but this life we've created actively works to suffocate the people on whose backs this country was raised. How can we say we're the land of the free while out on the streets cops murder legally? People have a right to be angry, upset, hurt, enraged, 
Wouldn't you be too if everything you were trying to change somehow always just stayed the same? No matter what you did, no matter how hard you tried, 400 years of perseverance still just to die at the hands of a person who claims they were just scared of a little boy in a park playing without a care in a world that sees him as a grown man, making sure he's in the system however they can. How does anyone recover from such a loss of life, of hope, of love, of faith in a world that always seems to take and take? It never gives back, never looks back, never holds back your cry for justice. I'll stand with you until I die for what is quite possibly the most important fight of his life, of her life, of your life and mine. Together we'll stand till the end of time. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. God. I mean, such wisdom from all of our four poets. Um, we're, we're now going to go into a little sort of brief Q&A because um, we want to know about how did you get started? What, what, what got you started writing poetry? Um, you know, that's always a thing I'd like to hear from poets or, or other writers. Is what got you started? Um, so we'll we'll do it, Janice, Tori, Tongo, Tony, whoever wants to, we'll do a popcorn style, but we'd love to to get a sense of what got you started. Okay. What got me started? It was yep. my way of finding my voice on the page because nobody would listen to me and because I felt invisible. And that was the way in which poetry, that poetry saved my life in a, in a sense, that I became visible on the page and I became heard by the page. Mm. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Tongo, what got you started writing some incredible poetry? Um, yeah, uh, uh, I, I have to to echo. It's a, it's just it's, it's, it's a it's a life saving uh, life saving conversation uh, between you know you you and and you and reality. But I I would have to credit um, the the village that really <laughs> the village that put me together <laughs> uh -huh. uh, because they you know they they. They um they were so um, politically committed um, and, and, and manifested that commitment in a um, uh, uh, really the, the 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 objective and practice of you know collective determination of reality you know and so. It was seamless, or um, it, it didn't feel unnatural uh, to, to for my mind to to ease into poetry um, as part of you know a, a tool of digesting reality in, in order to in order to transform it. So just kind of poetry, just being a parallel of critical thinking, um, you know, that's what. I, I, that's what made it natural. Wow, I, and I really, you know, feel what you said about it being part of survival. Right? You and Janice both talked about that. That's that's, yeah, that that's that's powerful stuff. Tori, um, what what got you write started writing poetry? I think a lot of the same, right? Like processing emotions, really just trying to find myself in a world that for me doesn't you know value queer women um in particular that's something that as I was trying to come into myself you know um it it did poetry saved me allowing myself to put words onto a page and and um my emotions and and you know just letting out uh the the frustration and, and the pain and, and the love and the all of it. Um, it that's really really where it where it came from. Um, well, thank you. Tony, brother. Yeah, I could you're on mute, brother. Yes. There you go. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I pretty much agree with uh, what uh, what what the other poet said. Um, 
I think for me too was uh, I um, I failed at everything else, mm. and a hundred yards away there was poetry just watching me fail, knowing that I was supposed to uh, you know gravitate and come to that place where where poetry lives, and poetry allowed me to finally speak. It, find, it, it allowed me to really say what was, was on my mind. And it, it showed me that uh, even if you fail or lose, you can still win. You know, you can still, through poetry, you can still win. And it doesn't even have to be a big win. A small mm -hmm. win can be the biggest uh, win. So for me, poetry allowed me, who had failed at mostly everything that I'd ever done, mm -hmm. and I could come out the other end um, in my own way, the middleweight champion of the world. I could be, you know, I could be Marvin Hagler, you know, with words. With words, I could be that. So it allowed me, it allowed me a way to fight, but fight with grace and fight with humor and to know what it was like to lose, you know? And I think that's what poetry showed me. It's like, hey, you had to really earn it and dig deep and go and, 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 and dig deep. And if you hit rock, you take that pen and you pulverize the damn rock and you go deep and, 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 not, and, not, and you get over the fear of hitting, of hitting the rock and hmm. seeing what's underneath and on the other side. Wow. Yeah. You know, we're all inspired by someone or, or something. And as you think of now, sort of where you are in, in all of your lives, um, who or what is that inspiration that, has, that, that inspires you to, to do it today? Um, Tori, do you, do you have an inspiration? I have many, many inspirations in my life. I have some amazing, wonderful people, um, you know, including many folks who are on the screen today. Um, but I think in terms of uh, somebody who inspires me in poetry, um, I would have to say Andrea Gibson. Um, they are my all time favorite poet uh, as a queer woman. They just really hit home for me. Um, and I think their poetry uh, has really inspired my poetry. Great, thank you. Tongo, what's your uh, inspiration? Let's see, I think he's still on. I know he had to leave early, but I still see him on. Um, we'll get back. Hopefully he's still, still around. Janice. Yes. Your inspiration. You're, you're everybody's inspiration. So who's your inspiration? <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Miguel. I wish. Um, I would say that there are many, many poets who are my inspiration. And I will start with saying that uh, the liberation poets were my inspiration, like Neruda and the African-American uh, poets like Hughes and Angelou and J Nikki and June Jordan and etc. But I think what continues to be my inspiration are the people. And what are the real struggles of the people? I mean, poetry is not to me some, you know, rarefied art form uh, that we're taught, in, you know, that we used to be taught, at least in my generation, uh, in high school and college and universities, that, you know, mo the valid poets, in quote, valid poets, were the Euro-American poets, even though I so admire William Carlos Williams and um, Devin Dickinson and I, many of the poets that have, in, and Pearl and Getty and the beat poets, I mean, so that isn't to deprecate anybody, but just to say that we were taught about a different form of aesthetic that wasn't the authentic aesthetic to our different cultures. So we had, I felt like I, we had to create our language. We had to create our own form and our own substance, our own messages that would tell the truth about our experiences, correct stereotypes and lies that have been created about us. 
So I think inspiration comes from authenticity and the authentic struggles of the people. Stop, Jan. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> great. That. Yeah. No, that's great. And uh, okay. what a lot of people may not know is that Dr. Maya Angelou uh, was one of your dear friends. Well, she's my mother. She truly encouraged me, helped me get published, encouraged me to keep writing, told me that anybody could be an executive director, so I better keep writing to be a great poet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know about the greatness part, but she said anybody can do administrative and executive things, mm -hmm. but not everybody can create art. So she said, you should create art because that is life. Right. Yes. And for those of you who don't know, Glide was Maya's home church when she lived here in San Francisco. So uh, there's a yeah. wonderful collection with, with uh, Dr. Angelou and, and Glide. Uh, Tony. Uh, you, you know that Maya said that Cecil was, one of, was her minister. Oh, and wow. He married all of her husbands as well as divorced her. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tony. Hi, Tony. No, it's okay. You know, Sorry. I draw, uh, you know, of course, my uncle Al Robles was a tremendous uh, influence. Uh, you know, what's funny about him was he never sat down and went over my work with a red pen. You know, he, um, you know, he was, he had a lot of, he had a lot of grace, you know, and we would just kind of talk about, you know, things in the community. He was never really pedantic. And I, I, I learned a lot from him. Um, if uh, those of you who are listening, if you go on YouTube, um, punch in a song. It was a old group from the 1970s called The Main Ingredient. They did a wonderful song called You've Been My Inspiration, You're Quite a Sensation. Beautiful. I, and I, I, I get a lot of inspiration from, from old uh, R&B music. You know, Sam and Dave, The Temptations, The Impressions. You know, those guys. Because, yeah. you know, like Curtis Mayfield in The Impressions, he had a line sa that said... Um, I think it was a song called Gypsy Woman. Her eyes were like that of a cat in the dark. Well, you just know, man, you know, it's that down home, it's that down home uh, stuff. But if we're talking about writers, uh, the dignity of James Baldwin, he mm -hmm. just makes me feel like, you know, his dignity, you know, is, is something that I really pick up on, his, his dignity. Um, Toshio Mori, I think, really just kind of captures a lot of a lot of spirit and a lot of warmth you know uh yokohama california his collection he he, he wrote a story called uh, the woman who makes swell donuts it's probably the uh, most beautiful short story i've, I've ever uh, uh read uh there's this other cat it was funny this other cat named lawson fusao inada who wrote a book called legends from camp and I would tell my uncle Al, I say, hey, this guy Lawson and out, I dig him, man. I just bought this book called Drawing the Line. Well, we went to a reading at, I think it was the Buddhist Center, the Zen Center in the city. And Lawson was there and I'd never met him. I didn't really know what he looked like. It turned out I was in the bathroom at the same time as Lawson. <laughs> and we were both at the urinal, right? <laughs> We walked out. My uncle said, hey, you know that cat that was there? You just walked with That's him. That's that guy you liked. Lawson, right? I said, okay. <laughs> but there, there are a lot of others, but Lawson and Nada, uh, Toshio Mori. I, I, I think Toshio Mori kind of, I guess he was writing during World War II, 1930s. I think there's something about that particular generation that, um, oh. that, that really... Um, it really is timeless, you know, that, that I, I really appreciate, you know. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, yeah. thank you. To uh, Tongo, your inspiration. You have to unmute yourself. There we go. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, right on. We're talking about inspiration. I'm, right on. Yeah, I've been here, I've been here. Um, uh, I, I would just add to the part of Audrey Lord, you know, um, mm -hmm. j just a, an, an yeah. impossible mind, you know. Um, to for me, reading her is like you know, reading the theory of relativity, or you know, <laughs> any of these kind of great, you know, just great exercises uh, of uh, of genius. So. I, I would definitely 
put put her in the diet if you haven't um, if you haven't already. Yeah. For when you do poetry, who are you writing for? Tori? Who am I writing for? I mean, honestly, I'm writing, I'm writing for me. It's it's my own experience, my own emotions, my own life on the page. And you know like I said, I, I haven't shared my poetry this widely before, um, but I, I think it's both for me and and for folks who can connect with it, right? Like, you know, we're all human. We all, we all to some extent, experience similar things. Like we're all living in the same age. And um, for me, it's all about, it's all about the feeling. It's all about the connection. Um, and so that's, that's why I wrote. Thank you. Tango, who are you writing for? You're still on mute. Here, let me. There we Back. go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ma'am, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, uh, as best I can, it's kind of hard to, uh, you can trip yourself up. If you keep try to keep too uh, uh, too solidified an audience in mind, but if I you know if, if I hope that I can contribute to anything, it's that cultural work. To you know, like Tony K. Uh, Bombard said, uh, you know, the job of the poet is to make revolution irresistible. Um, at, at this point, I'll just settle for normal. <laughs> so, you know. I'm just trying to uh, to to re uh, help help uh, you know kind of masses reabsorb that that word <laughs> and that potential um, and that and, and, and that way of relating to each other. Cool, thank you, Janet. Oh, I gotta go, y'all. Sorry. All right, thanks a lot, Tango. Appreciate you. Tango, thank you. See you on the twenty first. Janice, who, who are you writing for? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think you write, I, I think the responsibility of a poet, any writer, artist, is to tell the truth. To tell the truth about your experience, to talk about um, what is real for you. So I guess in part you're writing for yourself because you're compelled to do that. And on the other hand, you write hoping, hoping that it will connect with other people, that the passion that you feel about whatever you're writing about will connect with other people's experience or connect with other people's empathy. Um, so that's a hard question. I think that one can sell one's soul by trying to write for an audience. So I try very hard not to do that. But on the other hand, I think I try very hard to write what is what I think is appropriate for the time and for the audience. Like Miguel, you as a Center of Social Justice for Center for Center for Social Justice and Rabbi Michael and all of those who are working so hard to bring to keep justice at the forefront of our values. That that that's that's the kind of targeting that I think poets and artists should be about, targeting mm. that which needs to be addressed mm. in society. Wow, thank you, thank you. Wow, Tony. Let me get you unmuted here. There we go. Yeah, yeah I write all my best stuff for uh, a fellow by the name of Miguel Bustos because <laughs> If I if I don't I don't want to you know I don't want to catch a beating over here. Oh. Uh, but um, I guess you know my my father was very uh, important to me in terms of my writing because you know he was uh, you know, he grew up in in San Francisco he was a he was a working class guy 
you know, and everything that I kind of know about writing really kind of comes through, through him. I, you know, he had me working for him. He had a small janitorial company when I was growing up and I was, uh, I couldn't do anything right. You know, I couldn't, I really, I absolutely could not do a damn thing right. But it was through those, that experience that I actually learned how to, how to write. He was, he was my boss, but he became, he was like a critic. And I, I was able to kind of metaphorically see the uh, connection between doing janitorial work and writing. And the honesty in which, you know, in the standard that he had in his work, mm. I, I kind of transferred that standard and that work ethic and that realness and that intention to, uh, to poetry. So much of uh, what I write is inspired by him. And um, when I write something, I think to myself, well, you know, would this be real to him? What would he think? And 9.999 times out of 10, if, if I think he like it, 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 it's usually, it's usually pretty good. And then when I send it to him, I'll say, well, did you get the poem? Say, yeah, I got it, man. I said, well, what'd you think? And he'd say two words. He'd pause and he'd say, that's some heavy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if he says that, man, then you know, you know, you're hitting on something, you know? That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You know, but, you know, just hearing even the sort of the, the four of you, there's different elements that you each have on, on style and the cadence and um, the themes. Um, what do you hope happens when, when people hear your poetry? What, what's, your, what's, your, what's your hope or your message or your call to action for people? Tony? Oh, uh, that, that's easy, uh, that they don't fall asleep. Okay. Um, no, uh, <laughs> no, what, no, what was the question again? What, 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 what do you hope happens when people hear your poetry? I want them to laugh and I want them to kind of maybe see possibilities to maybe look at, uh, look at life maybe in a, in a, in a different way and to give, to give hope. You know, there are a lot of people out there that are hurting, a lot of people that don't feel like they have a voice. And if I can inspire uh, folks to um, to write or vocalize uh, or to get involved in some way in community, then uh, you know, I I I, I I'd like n nothing nothing better actually. Yeah. Right on. Thank you, Tori. I just want people to feel. I want people to feel, and I want people to to just bask in the glory of their feelings and of emotions and of the world. And then, then I hope that they do something about that and that they take that and they make something of it. Even if it's small, it does not have to be big, just a little something. Wow, okay. Janice. Yes. Well, I, I agree with Tony and with uh, Tori that that what we, you know, if you have an effect on anybody, like one of my most gratifying moments are when people, when women particularly come up to me and say, wow, thank you for talking about being invisible or being uh, marginalized or being put down or pe being sexualized because that is my experience and I'm so afraid to talk about it. I didn't think, I, I thought I was alone. To, to make that connection with other human beings, Tori, like with the LBGQ community and say, you're not alone. Your feelings are, I mean, I feel your feelings or I have been through, or these are my experiences. Your experiences are my experiences. Tony, you know that we have been through so much, excuse me, S in terms of at the Asian American community, the Filipino community, how we have been displaced, how we've been, you know, ripped out of our homes, how we as elders have been so mistreated and, and marginalized. And I think we've been that for us to know that we're not alone. I think that that's really a very powerful um, purpose. Yeah. I mean, it's not maybe what you go after. It's not maybe what you're, what you're thinking 
oh, I'm going to accomplish this thing is, but rather when people come to you and say, gee, I made that connection. It's so gratifying. Wow. That, that you know, that's, that's so true. So, I mean, you, you, all three of you and all four of you with Tongo, I mean, the fact that, um, you, you know, you, you put the message out there and it's a call to action. And the action could be self-reflection or it could be like, let's hit the streets, but it's a call to action. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, um, one of the things we're doing at the Center for Social Justice is we're going to be uh, looking at doing some poetry sessions, hopefully in person. Um, but we want to do them at different coffee shops and we want to work with some young people and some older folks to really get the word out about us speaking our truth. And so we will hold some classes at Glide on how to write poetry. So Tony, we have you in public saying you'd like to teach. So maybe Glide could be one of those places where you can some teach. And Tori, you are not far away. So, and Janice, neither are you. So we got some excellent teachers that could help us um, really, especially during this time of so much darkness, help us see the light with our own voices. And so that's gonna be, I think, an exciting time. And in an ideal world, we would be together, most likely in a sanctuary saying, you know, that's right, but we're doing the next best thing, which is here on Zoom. And we want to thank everybody. So to close us out, um, we've asked our poets to save the most powerful poem for the end. And, um, you know, this is going to set the tone for the, our marching orders, you know, the call to action so that tomorrow when we wake up, we know that there's work to do, whether it's in ourselves or with each other, uh, but we're gonna do it together, which is that's the beauty I think of, of this session today is that the poetry spoke to all of us because we're all going through something, but we, we do it together. And that's, that's the magic of Glide. That goes to our values of unconditional love and radical inclusivity. So I, if you like what you saw tonight, please sign up because we're gonna have a lot more coming. We have another event in, in May. We actually have two events in May, um, but be a part of our family, be, a, be, be kin to us. Um, and I just can't wait till we're all able to get together to be able to do this, this live. Um, and if you're not in San Francisco, still zoom in. Um, or if you're not in the Bay Area, you're still part of our family. So you're not going to get rid of us. Um, so with that, we're going to hear from Tori, then Tony, and then Janice who's going to kick us off at the end. So Tori. Right, um, Uh-oh, I lost it. Here it is. This poem is called Free. As I climb through the branches of the tree that is my mind, I glance around and wonder at the complexity, the enormity. How does it all fit? Why are some spaces so cavernous and others so tightly knit? How come there is no direct route to anything? Why do I have to wade through years of unpleasantness only to find my path blocked? Turn around, go back, relive it again. You want freedom? Well, this is it. Tend to your wounds so they don't spring to life and hurt others. Find where you were the aggressor so you can remember what it's like to have power. Watch again as you were the victim so you can instead stake your claim as a survivor. Take back your strength, but don't use it to subject and subdue. Use it to amplify the hurt until no one can say it's untrue. So we all feel the pain, the shame. Stop playing games, just say their names. Hear their cries, raise your eyes to the prize. Break the system that is broken. Only then can we truly thrive. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. All right, Tony. Asking you uh, to unmute. There we go. Okay. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, to the poets and thank you so much for everybody that uh, took time to uh, take part and um again janice nice to nice to see you and miguel and tori and and tango um this uh this song is called my father's music my father's music percolates and palpitates like hot coffee dreaming a tap dancer's arrival 
hitting throat with the right note going back deep unopposed. My father's music is caught in a kettle whose grease endured screams and flame of gas stove decisions where, where curling irons bent notes and contemplated hooks landing on the chin and announcing its verdict on a rippled canvas. My father's music is a empty cup of my favorite things where soup is made from pain and love is made from rain. My father's music is made in wood when he would, then wouldn't, then would again. And wood is softer than stone, and wouldn't you know it? My father's music is the chamber of cool, poking into the greenness of the sun's estate of ecstatic static. My father's music is sky minus rain divided by sun, multiplied by incense in the smoldering pyramid of branches. My father's music is the in-time pantomime of the heaven-held debate whose defense rests on the eighth day. My father's music floats and glides and slides from head to thigh and on that other side where up is down and down is up, sticking like flapjacks whose wings lap, lap, lap the tick-tock oil of greasy time. My father's music skips, bumps, burps, slurps, sizzles on the sunny side of the street. Crackle, pop, bop, pan, fried with an egg on top. My father's music. Mm. Yes, indeed it is. Sorry. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Janice. Miguel. Yes. Tell me. Uh, do you, I, sh should I try to keep a poem short or should I read a, can I read it longer? I mean, tell me how much time we have because I know that we're limited by time. Whatever you want. We all have time. <laughs> well, I'm torn between reading a poem to El Robles because Tony is here and a, yes. a, a poem about women because Tori is here and because everybody else is here, hopefully. So why don't you do both? No, too long. <laughs> well, um, thank you, Daryl. <laughs> Tony, I miss you. I really miss our times together. We were so crazy. And Al was so crazy. He was my, he was my beloved brother. But I'm going to read this poem to, I think, women who broke, her, broke their silence. Mothers, grandmothers, we know we, you are here to, we are here today because you gathered your dreams, your songs, our destiny in the wings of your arm, in the bow of your back. We will not forget, forget you. We cannot be still. There are women who are moving. These faces are you, me, are light colors of all earth, legs skinny, short, fat, long, stretching, stretching, stretching legs, muscular, marching legs. There are women who are we with tongues of fire. Mother who cradles a son dying for maids. Daughter who is abused, leaves her addicted mother, another homeless teenager. Sister who breaks the silences of incest and rape, breaks the cycle of violent men. She is we, we birthing ourselves, tongues of fire. There are women who are choosing, recovering from addictions and pass passivity, powerlessness, women who are gathering to fight guns and senseless death, children killing children, hate crimes and racism's neglect. There are women who are weeping in Bosnia, mothers king for their, their dead children. In Rwanda, they struggle no less loudly for bread and freedom. In Hiroshima, the salt of her tears mingles with hers in San Salvador, Sierra Leone, Bujal, the Baghdad in Tiananmen Square and hers in the hospitals of Harlem, Columbine, Laramie, Jasper, Los Angeles, Minnesota, and ours in too many other cities where more infants die than any other industrial industrialized country. But women are marching, women are moving. Women are dancing in a language that all understand from our shelters and sweatshops 
from field and factory cannery, internment camp senior citizen and new immigrant ghettos, from kitchens and bedrooms and offices, senate chambers, school rooms, boardrooms, tongues are afire. You are joining for justice to fight breast cancer, AIDS, sexual harassment, workplace discrimination, unequal pay, and concrete ceilings. We are dressing our shoulders with power. From them, we lift up our legacy. My daughter tells me of peer pressures and insecurities. We speak of woman fear, self-sabotage, suicide. I told her I thought at one time I would never reach the age of 40. Not me. Reckless, chain-smoking, high-diving, fast-driving, pill-popping college student. Then I thought it wasn't cool to reach 40. Slogan yelling, war practicing, gin drinking, yellow power fisted revolutionary. Now that I'm really well past 40, I tell my daughter, please, if I ever talk about you suicide, remind me that I'm terrified of heights, needles, Los Angeles traffic, San Francisco traffic, bladder infections, and home can beats. Now I just want to live each day to enjoy my hot flashes, mood swings, crazy, crave my discarded cigarettes, fondly remember when I can remember a time of effortless slenderness. I tell her of my need for justice, for my husband to embrace me and to see her face that reveals the miracle of rainbows, the goodness in me, a circle that continues, and my hope for a world for her that breathes cleanly with equality, freedom to choose, and freedom from war. For our daughter's children, we must be women moving, women changing more than ever, joining together. The power of this love ignites us from inside. From the torches of all our tongues, all is lit. The stories, songs, testimonies, poems, chants, legends, the wit fire in our legs, stretching to the march. Watch out. Women are moving. We are marching. We are changing. We are choosing. We are healing. We are voting. Wow, that's so beautiful, Janice. Thank you so much. Wow. So we, before we, we, we want to thank the poets, I, I want to take this time to thank uh, Hannah, Van El Hannah Van Elston and Eric Arguello from the Center for Social Justice for making this happen, uh, doing all the work behind the scenes, all the emails you got, and, and just playing the video of Amanda Gordon and everybody. Thank you so much. Um, we, will, we have recorded this, so this will go on our website, so go to Glide. Dot org and if you want to go back and relive this incredible session you'll be able to do that and we'll also put the bios of our poets so that you could hopefully go to your local bookstore and buy their books um, because we need to support each other um, Tony Tori and Janice we cannot thank you thank you enough for being one our, our, our voice when we could not speak, right? And when we can't speak, you, you are all channeling our pain, but also the love and the hope that we have for a better world. And we cannot thank you enough on behalf of Glide and the team here. So um, everybody, if you like this, if you got some inspiration, please don't forget to come on Sunday at Glide Church because there's a lot of music, a lot of spoken word that happens there on Sundays. Be on the lookout on our, on our website for more programming that we're going to be happening. And I cannot wait till we are together. All right. We can hug each other. So get your vaccination. If you don't get, if you don't know where to get your vaccination, Glide is a vaccination site. And so we are vaccinating people. Um, so feel, feel free to, to check our website for that as well. Um, everyone be safe. Poets, we cannot thank you enough for just being our voice and our light during this time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone thank have you. a good night. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everybody in the Center for Social Justice Department. And thank you, Blythe. And thank you, poets. 
I yes. love seeing you, Tony. I miss right you. Right on. Bye. See you now. Take Bye. care, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.